Why, hello, nerds. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And here I am, your host, Liv. Well, tis the season, am I right? Yes, it is that time again. Happy Pride Month. So here's the thing. I've made Pride Month episodes a tradition on the podcast, and I absolutely love that you all enjoy them and appreciate them as much as you do. I think it's really important to tell stories of diverse genders and love and relationships across genders, especially in the ancient world that is so often shaped by this dangerous view of a so-called ideal society that was seen as patriarchal and straight and white and not at all diverse in anything else. Ugh. All of that is major epic bullshit, thus my episodes. Plus, who doesn't want to see themselves in these stories of myth, even if most of them are tragic as fuck? I have to admit, too, I started this episode thinking I would actually be repeating some of the stories that I've already told in recent years, and that I would have to be telling multiple stories today in order to get to an episode length. And, well, a tiny part of that is true. I'm running very low on stories of LGBTQIA characters that I haven't told already, but in the course of believing that I had to retell some past stories today, I actually managed to find a version of one that was somehow extensive enough for not only one, but two episodes. Fortunately, every now and again, you run into a surviving epic that provides you with an absolute wealth of content, even if it's not particularly traditional and not all useful or even remotely as old as most of the stories I tell you. But more on that in a moment. Because this all came about because of my love of revisiting some stories that I've told from the early days of the podcast. It's really incredible the things I've learned since I started the show almost four years ago now, and one of my favorite things to do because of that is to show those things I've learned, and thus the evolution of this podcast, through retelling stories from those early days, examining sourcing and varying versions, the timeline of sources, everything imaginable. Which is how we got today's episode, which is actually not that. See, technically I've told you this story, kind of, in an early Pride episode, but it was so brief because 99% of sources barely talk about this story, and also it was completely different. All they do is tell you about the boy who loved Dionysus, who became wine grapes. All the sources except this one very wordy epic poet. This is episode 128, the god of many names and many lovers, Dionysus and Ampelus. Before we dive into our beloved god of wine, he of so, so many names, I do want to take a minute to talk a bit about the terms that we use and the understanding of sexual attraction and relationship when it comes to the ancient Greeks. See, an interesting thing you learn when you're around more academic world of Greek history and mythology is a tendency towards caveats when it comes to sexuality in the ancient world. I get it. I think that's important. It's interesting. I also don't want to do a lot of it on this show. Except for after I explain. So if you're talking historicity and a broad and nuanced understanding of the mythology, you do have to come to terms with the fact that while many of these stories might seem somewhat progressive to us, they weren't necessarily as progressive as we want them to be, or at times progressive at all. Yes, there are stories of same-sex relationships in Greek mythology and history, but that doesn't mean that anyone was necessarily out there identifying as gay or even an equivalent. This is both because of societal expectations and because, well, they would have had no idea what the fuck we're talking about. The people of ancient Greece wouldn't know gay or straight or bi or anything. They would simply know people who might have gone against the societal expectations and norms when it comes to 
who they were with or how they identified. And often those people would have probably paid a price for that part of their lives. And then there's the pederasty, the ancient Greek concept of relationships between older men and boys that were, yes, often sexual. I'm not going to go there because it's not helpful, it is dark, and just all around not a place I want to go. But in case you haven't heard the word before, that's it. It was a big part of a lot of that world. And it's not a good or honest example of gay relationships because it was based in an inherent power dynamic between mature men and young men or boys that I would say completely negates anything that might suggest a pro-homosexual or generally more progressive society. But I tell you all of this not to blow up anyone's dreams of a history of LGBTQIA people, because I'm not, and as always, much of this month is going to be devoted to characters who would probably identify within that realm if they had those words. Still, I do think it's interesting and important to examine the intricacies of this and the historical dynamics at play. And most of that applies primarily to historical characters rather than mythological. They still wouldn't have had the words, but they also had more freedoms because they weren't real. <laughs> Let's be honest, though, I'm telling you all of these interesting historical details because I'm a nerd and I find the nuance and intricacies of history and mythology fucking fascinating. And you're listening to me, so you probably do too, or at least you enjoy the sound of my voice enough to deal with it. Still, to be very clear, there were absolutely gay people in the ancient world, and there were absolutely trans people and everyone else. They just wouldn't call themselves either, and they wouldn't have been able to live freely as themselves. They didn't have names for how they felt or identified. But fortunately, we have those names now, and it is very important, especially when it comes to trans people, to note that there absolutely were people of diverse genders in the ancient world, and the ancient Greeks at least absolutely found ways to understand the issues those people had when it comes to their own body and physical anatomy. And now I'm rambling a bit, but ultimately my intention here is to make the case for how we examine ancient people and point out the issues a lot of professionally smart people have with using modern terms to define ancient and mythological people, and also to say... I'm still going to use those more finite modern terms where appropriate, because I think it's important in a podcast like mine that is commercial and broad and isn't academic to give people of today someone in the ancient world and mythology to look at and see themselves. Honestly, that can only be beneficial to everyone, especially those that fall into the wide spectrum of LGBTQIA. Now, one thing you've probably noticed and will continue to notice is that most of the same-sex relationships we see in Greek mythology are between two men. Why, you ask? Why is anything the way it is when it comes to this podcast? Yes, it was the patriarchy. A combination of expectations across the genders and whose stories we actually have – neither of which favored women, let alone women deviating from the societal norm. And so we have very few stories of LGBTQIA people who identify as women and stay that way. That is, that aren't in fact trans men who are then transformed into biological men by the gods. My go-to would be Artemis, who I believe would identify as a lesbian today. Though I will admit, I haven't formed any real opinions on how some of the other goddesses we might identify within that spectrum would identify themselves. Athena, for instance, I'm not so sure about. Regardless, I say all this to preface another episode that I'll be covering this month of Pride, because we do have one very famous and very real woman who existed in that realm of sexuality, Sappho, who will have an episode devoted to her in two weeks' time. But none of this is the point of today's episode, except where it is, because I think it's interesting and important to talk about LGBTQ representation in mythology. Still, today we're visiting that god of it all, that often gender-fluid, definitely super bisexual god of wine and partying and good times, except maybe when it came to his boyfriends. Bromius, Brisaius, Lucius, Liber, Bacchus, Dionysus. Dionysus is, as we all well know, the most fun-loving and fluid of the gods. 
He was everything. He played with his gender identity, though I do call him he because that's the only pronoun we really have for him, and he found love with men and women. One of Dionysus' more famous love affairs with a young man is with the satyr named Ampelus. I've told this story before, but I wasn't using its most epic and lengthy source, known as his Dionysiaca, the longest surviving epic from antiquity devoted to the heritage and life of Dionysus himself. Now, one thing about this epic is important to make clear. It is very late. It is from the 5th-ish century AD, so we're talking well over a thousand years after Hesiod and Homer, about a thousand years after the tragedians. He was an Egyptian poet in Hellenized Egypt, i.e. after the Greeks took over, but in fact much later than that because he was actually around during Imperial Rome. So I don't want to suggest that his story in the detail I'm about to give was accepted in ancient Greece, but Nonus was working in the tradition of Homer and could very well have been working off of sources we don't have, as he definitely was influenced by the Homeric epics that we do have as well as those that are lost. All the same, it's still an ancient epic, and it tells the story of an ancient god, and at least this part of it is also quite lovely. Because in this part of the Dionysiaca, it tells the story of Dionysus and Ampelus in the most detailed way, beginning with a scene where a young Dionysus, just barely out of childhood, is beating the heat of Helios by splashing around in a stream in Lydia, Asia Minor, in the region of the Turkish Peninsula. A reminder, too, that Dionysus, among all those other names I said earlier, is also called Bacchus interchangeably. The Dionysiaca, at least in this section, is gorgeous. I've only read bits and pieces of it so far for the podcast, and this section is great and other sections are kind of wild. But the way it describes Dionysus when he meets Ampelus is truly lovely. Dionysus splashes around, swimming in this river with a bunch of satyrs, all enjoying a midday swim to cool off. Quote, Playful satyrs lifted their heels in air and tumbled, plunging head over into the river. One self-propelled swam with paddling hands prone on the waves and imprinted a footstep on the swell. As he pushed with back-stretching legs and cut the water rolling in riches, one dived deep down to the underwater caves and hunted for speckled fishy prey down below, stretching a groping hand over the swimming fry, left the deeps again and offered to Bacchus the fish purpled with the slime of the opulent river. You all know how I love reading quotes. Basically, what a beautiful day, a beautiful scene between God and satyrs just splashing around, enjoying the river. It sounds delightful. And that is where Dionysus finally spots the young satyr Ampelus. Dionysus finds Ampelus to be absolutely gorgeous. I like to think they're about the same age, though you never know. We're going to go with they are. He is just the most beautiful man Dionysus has ever seen, just striking and stunning, and oh my gods, how can anyone be quite so beautiful? These are the thoughts running through Dionysus' mind, and while he pretends that he himself is not a god, at least for now, he starts to flirt with Ampelus. He flatters the man, asking how he could be so beautiful, which gods are his parents, for he must have immortal parents, Dionysus explains, because how else could he possibly have turned out like he has? It's flattery, definitely, and flirty, absolutely, but there's also a sincerity in the way it's described that I think is somewhat unique to Dionysus, at least in the way I see him. He's sincere and often just a nice guy. He has his issues, yes, but ultimately Dionysus just 
feels to be the least threatening, the most lovely and genuine of the gods. As he continues to make eyes at Empelus, chatting up the young man, he asks, quote, What father begat you? What immortal womb brought you forth? Which of the graces gave you birth? What handsome Apollo made you? Tell me, my friend, do not hide your kin. If you come another Eros unwinged, without arrows, without quiver, which of the blessed slept with Aphrodite and bred you? But indeed I tremble to name Cypris as your mother, for I would not call Hephaestus or Ares your father. <laughs> Ampelus is, as you might imagine, incredibly taken with Dionysus. Here's this guy, he's gorgeous and flirty and fun and so, so charming, and he's telling Ampelus that he's just the most beautiful man he's ever seen. The pair hit it off immediately, and before long, Dionysus spends every waking moment thinking of Ampelus, and while it's not explicit, because this story is more devoted to the actions of the god, I'd like to imagine that Ampelus feels the same. I know I would. Dionysus is so taken with Ampelus that he finds himself distracted by everything else in his life. If music plays in the woods, satyrs beating on drums, but Ampelus isn't around, Dionysus is unmoved by it. If he attempts to play his own instruments, but Ampelus isn't there, he simply can't even get into his own songs. When he's with Ampelus and the man stops speaking to Dionysus, Dionysus becomes immediately sad, bummed out, just missing Ampelus' voice. And worst of all, if Ampelus dances amongst the other satyrs, everyone joining in, Dionysus is full of envy. Now, is this healthy in modern terms? Absolutely not. Is it kind of endearing when you're reading about it in an ancient epic, given it involves two consenting men who we will call adults for these purposes because it's actually a little questionable, but that would just make it too weird? Yes. Dionysus' jealousy when it comes to Ampelus grows and grows. He is distracted by everything that happens, everyone around him that isn't Ampelus, every action he has to do that doesn't involve the man. <sighs> Even worse, everyone Ampelus interacts with that isn't Dionysus just makes the jealousy worse. The god is completely overtaken with his feelings, with his love. Dionysus' fear over Ampelus being taken away from him gets to the point where he finds himself constantly worried that even another god will take Ampelus away. Dionysus worries that Zephyr will come along and catch Ampelus' attention, like he did with Hyacinthus, or that Zeus will fly over as an eagle one day and snatch up Ampelus, abducting him like he did with Ganymede. Dionysus goes so far as to worry that Poseidon himself will snatch Ampelus like he did with Pelops, a story I have not and will not tell for Pride Month because Poseidon. Here Dionysus is explicitly worried that Poseidon will actually abduct and rape Ampelus, giving further evidence to my Poseidon is the actual worst god theory. Consent issues on most of these references aside, Dionysus is now at the point where he's catastrophizing his own relatives coming for his boyfriend. And so, yeah, this is where I draw the line and sit the dude down and say, like, this is not a healthy relationship. Still, it is passionate as fuck, and that is something. And hey, so far, again, pretty consensual between the two, and that's rare enough that maybe we can just embrace it. But Dionysus' jealousy and fears just don't let up. He continues to worry about what will happen, to the point where it seems to me that he isn't even spending any time with Ampelus. He isn't actually enjoying any kind of relationship with the man because he's so busy worrying that he'll be taken away from him. And when another satyr takes notice of Ampelus and makes his own attraction clear... Dionysus prays to his own father, to Zeus himself, to help him keep hold of Ampelus' affections. 
He calls to Zeus, suggesting that Zeus give away all of the favors he has intended for his son. He tells Zeus to give his lightning to Hephaestus, that he doesn't need Zeus's clouds or thunderclap. He says to, quote, let Ares have a corslet of your clouds to cover his chest. Give the pouring rain shower of Zeus as largesse to Hermion. Let Apollo, if you will, wield his father's lightning. No, he says, I don't need any of that, any gifts from my father, the god of the sky. I want only the love of Ampelus. As he continues his pleas to Zeus, he once more mentions Ganymede, as though he is Zeus's equivalent to Dionysus and Ampelus. With these pleas to his father out of the way, Dionysus finally spends actual time with Ampelus. This alone makes me feel better about their relationship, honestly, because Dionysus was becoming a bit much. Finally, though, they are together, and the way their time together is described is nothing short of suggestive, while still being distinctly Greek mythology. Quote, Both played in the woods together, now throwing the thyrsus to travel through the air, now on some unshaded flat, or again, they tramped the rocks, hunting the hill-bred lion's cubs, Sometimes alone on a deserted bank, they played on the sands of a pebbly river and had a wrestling bout in friendly sport. No tripod was their prize, no flower-graven cauldron lay ready for the victory, no horses from the grass, but a double pipe of love with clear-sounding notes. It was a delightsome strife for both, for mad love stood between them, a winged Hermes in the ring, wreathing a love garland of daffodil and iris. Double Pipe of Love What follows this announcement of a double pipe of love as prize for their so-called wrestling contest is, well, a very detailed description of the so-called wrestling contest between Dionysus and Ampelus. Phrases like, quote, Bacchus was in heaven amid this honey-sweet wrestling, and love gave him a double joy lifting and lifted. And, quote, Bacchus ran his two hands round the young man's waist, squeezing his body with a loving grip. And even better, quote, Thus, while Bacchus lay willingly on the ground, the boy sat across his naked belly, and Bacchus, in delight, lay stretched at full length on the ground, sustaining the sweet burden on his paunch. At one point, he's described as having, quote, dislodged the beloved burden. And thus, when their wrestling matches over, quote, both rolled in the dust and the sweat poured out to tell them they were tired. (laughs) And to cap it all off, it seems that Dionysus lost on purpose, letting Ampelus have it. The prize, the double pipe of love. And, well, after this wrestling match for the double pipe, they decide they aren't done competing yet, so they hold a very not-at-all-erotic foot race with a bunch of other dudes that is much less exciting than the wrestling match. But when Ampelus seems like he's going to lose the match to the two others competing, Dionysus fills in with speed and messes with the other two so that in the end, Ampelus still comes out on top. When Ampelus has won the foot race, he celebrates with Dionysus, throwing his arms around the god in excitement. And one of the men he beat in the race, Iobacus, sees how excited Ampelus is to have won two competitions, so he suggests the man go for a third. You've done so well so far, he says. Why not try to beat Dionysus in a swimming competition? He suggests that Ampelus and Dionysus compete against each other in the stream, just the two of them. If you win this match too, Iobacus adds, I'll give you a double garland to show you've beat Dionysus twice. Of course, this is just too exciting for Ampelus to bear. I mean, two garlands? What is he going to do with those riches? 
So he quite eagerly agrees to compete with Dionysus once more, this time whilst wet. Once more, the two compete, this time in the river, swimming against one another in a competition that I gather is for who is the fastest, but frankly, Nona seems less concerned with the particulars there and more concerned with the fact that, once more, Dionysus lets Ampelus win. Just like the foot race, this is far less erotic than the wrestling match, though. As with all competitions of this nature, they are still naked, so that's something. And so, Ampelus wins once more. He's won the three competitions, two against Dionysus himself. He's won all the glory he could have imagined just moments ago when the idea was first proposed to him. He's absolutely thrilled, proud of himself, and looking to celebrate. To do this, Ampelus begins to adorn himself like a bacchant, or even like Dionysus himself. He begins with, well... A crown of vipers. Vipers. His first thought in dressing up like Dionysus is to crown himself with a wreath of snakes. And yeah, like, I assume they must be dead because they don't immediately kill him. But all the same, that is absolutely horrifying and might be one of the most troubling things I've ever read in Greek mythology. I do not like snakes. Vipers? My god, Empelus. Vipers? Honestly. But as much as I wish this was a story about what a bad idea it is to crown yourself with a wreath of snakes, that actually isn't the point here and nothing bad happens with, you know, the crown of vipers. Instead, it's just the beginning of the costume, the piece that most closely mirrors Dionysus' own way of dressing. But Ampelus follows the vipers by clothing himself in basically leopard print to continue imitating his boyfriend, the god who he might now know is a god? Unclear. Next, Ampelus sees Dionysus as he's driving his chariot pulled by panthers, because he's Dionysus and he's really fucking cool. So to imitate that too, Ampelus climbs atop the back of a bear and rides it. Yes, a bear. And then that isn't enough, and somehow the bear doesn't kill him, so he rides a lion and even whips it. And then that isn't enough, and somehow this fucking lion doesn't kill him either. So then he rides a tiger... And guess what? The tiger doesn't kill him either. What kind of wild animals are these? Of course, now Dionysus spots his beloved Ampelus. And no, he doesn't say, Ampelus, maybe don't ride these wild beasts. Because I guess we have to assume that these are tamed Dionysian creatures. And it just wasn't just any old lion that Ampelus found, climbed on the back of, and then whipped. No, because Dionysus is less concerned with the riding of the wild animals that could maul his boyfriend with a single swipe of their paw. And instead, he's just like... Hey, why are you so deep into the forest? Stay close to me. Don't don't go that deep into the forest. Priorities. I just don't understand these priorities. Regardless, Dionysus is now concerned with the well-being of his boyfriend, who's getting a little showy with his newfound victories in athleticism. Dionysus tells Ampelus that he should stay alongside him, that they will hunt together, and that Ampelus doesn't need to fear all these wild animals that he's been riding. Which, I mean... Obviously, he wasn't really fearing them in the first place, but that instead, actually, the animal that Ampelus does need to fear is the bull. So they continue on, but Ampelus is still feeling quite fearless, like he's just invincible. And this is when Dionysus first sees the portent. He experiences a prophecy And suddenly Dionysus has the knowledge that his beloved Ampelus doesn't have long to live. Oh, nerds, thank you all so much for listening. With that cliffhanger that's also a spoiler the rest of their story next week like i've said keeping up with these lgbtqia stories after all this time and all the limitations on actually how many exist can be tough but i'm thrilled that i've set up this expectation you with you all because it actually led me to force it a bit this week which i think had great results i hadn't realized that there was so much more to the story of dionysus and ampelus if you just read that super late weirdo old epic that's actually quite entertaining it's a story that i told so 
briefly so long ago, and its whole point is just to explain wine grapes. And then turns out there's this whole other fascinating version that's completely different. I'm just just thrilled that sometimes I just kind of stumble upon these things, especially when I'm working towards an expectation that I wouldn't have otherwise had a reason to find it. Anyway, next week, the end of their story that actually leads into another story of two men in love. And the week after, Sappho herself. But the fun of today's episode isn't done yet, because in the vein of all this important and fun history of LGBTQIA people, today I'm actually going to leave you with an audio trailer for a new YouTube series that was started by a listener of this podcast, Tom Ransweiler, who has had conversations with experts on the history of some of the most famous LGBTQIA people in history, including... Madeline Miller, who talked about Achilles and Patroclus, and her episode comes out on the same day as this episode you're listening to right now. I just know you're all going to lose it over that conversation. I will also be on the show coming up. We're recording the same day this releases as well. So much happening on this Tuesday, June 1st. You can find the YouTube series via the link in the episode description or by searching Gay History with Tom Ransweiler R-A-N-Z-W-E-I-L-E-R. I have to say, I have watched the episode with Madeline Miller already, and it's really, really fascinating and interesting. I think you're all really going to enjoy that YouTube series. And so, the trailer. They were military commanders, poets, playwrights. One was even part God. What do they all have in common? If alive today, they'd probably identify under the LGBTQ umbrella. The truth is, gay history doesn't just go back decades. It goes back centuries. You can find LGBTQ figures in some of the world's biggest events in history and pop culture. Some change the face of the earth through conquest. It gets very close to conquering the entire world, closer than anybody else has ever gotten anyway. Others created the most beautiful pieces of art that we still consume and perform today. The poem is about, I see you, and when I see you, I can't even talk. My tongue is broken. Oh my God, doesn't that just do it to you? They have just been straight washed by those who wrote the history. It, it wasn't talked about. It was just, you know, it was the old, oh, they were, they were close friends. But guess what? The secret is now out. In this weekly Pride Month series, I'll talk to some of the world's leading experts on those major historical figures who were shoved back into the closet. Come for the fun. If Sappho wasn't such a good poet, it could be something more vulgar, like, I'm wet. <laughs> <laughs> the Frank. Without mentioning the caltrops, it's absolutely farcical. And the enlightening conversations. We'd even suggest that Shakespeare's bisexuality is in part the reason that he's such a great writer. Stay for what you definitely did not learn in history class. Gossip was more about who was on top and who was on bottom. <laughs> <laughs> because if you're queer, your history is much deeper than you think. And you deserve to be proud of it. Oh, thank you all so much for listening. You were all the best. I am Liv and I love this shit. Thank you.